Let me welcome you. Let me welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see and looking forward to hearing from you all today. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm the moderator. I'm also the chief cat herder for the day. Over this past few weeks, we've polled the forum audience and asked people, what do they think? What does the community think about the forum so far? What are your opinions about our different programs? And what are your suggestions about different experiments and tweaks that we have been doing and are considering? And the results have been really, really rich. I just wanted to share them with you. Just go to tinyurl.com slash forum reflects, and you'll see a link to my blog post of, and a whole bunch of charts of what people think which is really, really interesting. Um, which social media platform people are most comfortable using to discuss forum issues, uh, what kind of new program efforts they'd like to try, as well as you know, what guests and themes they'd like to explore. So please check that out and explore. We're really grateful to everybody who has uh, filled out the form so far. Now, that's it for where this all comes from. That's where all the uh, uh, different technology is and how it works. What I'd like to do right now is welcome our guest. Uh, Michael Horn is a fantastic writer and a consultant, well, well known in the higher education space. And you know him because he was a guest about a year and a half ago. He was terrific talking about the uh, labor market's connection to, uh, to higher education. He's the author of a brand new book, which is just coming out today, Taking the Education World by Storm, called Choosing College, which is a new look at how students should think about college and how they should think about their path through college as well as what college can do for them. Uh, it's an incredibly accessible book. Uh, it shows the efforts of a lifetime of thinking about education, where it could go. I wish I'd had this when I was a bright young 18-year-old, and I wish I'd had it when my kids were 18. Uh, let me just welcome Michael Horn. Michael, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. Our pleasure. I'm really glad to uh, to see you here. Listen, I'm, you know, normally I ask guests, I say, well, what are you going to be doing for the next year? And I know your first thing is going to be saying, I'm going to be going all over the place talking about this book. And in fact, you're doing it right now today, not just in our forum, but you're going somewhere else in just a little while. Um, but let me ask if, if I could, what are some of the responses you've been getting to this book? I mean, besides my, my, own, my own fetishness, what are some of the uh, resonances that this book has had with people? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it's obviously, I, I think this is officially the launch day that Amazon is shipping. So we're just find, starting to find out. But I'll tell you uh, maybe some of the positive ones, and then I'll tell you one negative one that I think is interesting because it's sure. Ways. So um, the positive ones, I think a lot of people are, are digging in and saying, hey, wow, you know, similar to you, this just opened my eyes about how to think about this process. A lot of parents have come to us and said, oh my goodness, this is giving me a language to talk to my kids about this decision. Mm. The third one that's really gratifying is that as parents are reading it, they're realizing, wait a second, this isn't just about my kid, this is about me now because we're all lifelong learners and we are actually gonna continue to learn in formal education settings to continue to skill up. And this is giving me a roadmap and way to think about the decisions that I have in front of me right now or that I should be thinking about. And I didn't mm. really know that. And so some people said choosing college is a very misleading title, uh, guilty yeah. charged. But, the, um, but I think it's kind of neat that people are saying, hey, this is actually, I bought it for my kid or, or I read it because I thought it would help my kid. And right. yeah, I'm doing that, but it's actually gonna help me. Now the negative, um, uh, one of the negative reactions, I think, is less a, a reaction on the book and more of uh, some of what we found in the book, uh, as, as we'll dig into. You know, we looked at why students choose college to get at the causal mechanism that's actually driving them to make the choice. Right. And there are a whole bunch of students who go for reasons that colleges are probably not thrilled <laughs> that they're going to them under. And so certain admissions officers uh, or past admissions officers, when they read the book, they said, I hate, you know, reason number X. Um, you know, you should be telling kids not to do that. And it's like, ah, uh. but that wasn't sort of the role of the book. The role of the book was to expose why they're going, whether we like it or not, and then give advice uh, about what, what to do or not do uh, once you find yourself in that situation. <laughs> well, it's often a good sign of a successful book that you manage to irritate people in just the right way. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, you Let's, let's, if I can grant you some success here, if I can grant you a, a broad readership and some influence, what would happen over calendar year, academic year 2019, 2020, if thousands and thousands of uh, students, would-be students and their families took heed of your advice? What are some of the changes that you expect to see in the world? 
Yeah, so I think the big one is that we'd like to see students stepping back from the college rat race that we've seen drive the varsity blues scandal mm. and, and you know, parents disowning their children to get financial aid packages and all sorts of craziness that's happened. And just say like, why am I going? What's my reason? And it doesn't have to be some magnanimous, I know the rest of my life. I mean, that's unrealistic. But once they understood why they were going, to make a more informed choice that really protected them from the downsides of not completing college, for example, and led them to make more productive choices. Uh, I think secondly, as a result, you'd start to see, and this wouldn't be in one year, this would be in several years, you'd start to see the actual uh, academic outcomes from colleges going up because you'd have better matchmaking uh, going on in the front end uh, from students. I think as you saw them becoming savvier consumers, you'd start to see colleges innovate to actually better serve these students because they would actually be making decisions more in accordance with uh, their purpose and what's driving them and what's likely to be a good match. And when they don't see something uh, that's out there that, that reflects where they are, uh, they would be making savvier decisions. And then the last thing I would say, uh, I think you'd see many more students actually taking a gap year before they went to college recognizing that they're just not quite ready to consume that college experience. And, and I want to say this clearly, uh, it's not that they won't go to college at some point, it's just that they might not be ready right now in their lives because they don't have enough clarity about their purpose, passion, strengths, abilities, uh, and things of that nature. That's a really powerful argument. And I mean, I saw that at the end of the book where you were having recommendations, and I couldn't tell if that was a recommendation for students and parents or for educators you know, to support it. Yeah, it's a great, I mean, so, and, and I think it's both, right? So that's the other side of it. What do we hope schools will do? Uh, I, I hope schools will design better front end experiences uh, that uh, A, are more honest with students about when their campus is not likely to be a good match uh, for what the student is trying to accomplish in their lives or where they are in their lives, yeah. but also actually partner to, to offer gap year type programs. And by the way, when I say gap year, I don't mean just backpacking around Europe and sort of taking a vacation for a year, but going through a series of immersive experiences, very experiential, where you get to be on the ground in a variety of jobs, you get to uh, try out some things, you get to take some courses, you get to maybe do some apprenticeships or internships, sure. and you learn about yourself at each stage. And wouldn't it be great if colleges would actually offer that experience or partner to offer that experience? Mm. Uh, on the front end, uh, maybe even given financial aid or even some college credit for what you learned during that experience. And then you'd come into the college really fired up, really aware of what you want to do, why you're there and and eager to learn. And there's, you know, there is some research out there that suggests when you control for GPA, when you control for uh, SAT scores and control for socioeconomic status, that students who take a gap year and then go to college, they do better. Why not make that part of college and sort of replace the uh, mm. Gen Ed start of a lot of colleges? So maybe uh, it's 2021, I get accepted to College X, and I say, that's great, but I'm going to spend the next year learning French and uh, trying to write a novel in French. Um, and I'm going to be doing that maybe in Alsace. And then in 2022, I'll show up on campus. And uh, either I'll be a French major or I'll learn that I never want to be a French major. <laughs> and what a great thing. I mean, I think, you know, something we didn't write about in the book that I, I maybe it's another book or, or, or maybe I, it's, it's an, I'm not sure which, but the, uh, you know, high schools, I think, need to do a much better job of actually building in some of those experiences so students can learn more about themselves, right? Like you just described, uh, I think uh, high school over the last several years has narrowed significantly in terms of focusing on test scores and things of that nature, and actually dropped a lot of the extracurricular activities or diversity of courses. And some of that pairing back was probably good, but I think we've gone overboard uh, and, and denied students the opportunity to really learn who am I, right? And start to get a deeper sense uh, of, of what turns you on and actually build passions. So you go into college super fired up about that learning experience in front of you. And if it's French uh, that's turning you on and writing novels, that's awesome, right? That you know that. And if after three months you're like, oh my goodness, this is the worst thing ever, <laughs> step back, evaluate what that means and try something else, right? Yeah. And in some ways, it's, it's almost like a series of gap bursts, not an entire year. Like how can you quickly prototype nice. design thinking uh, and some thinking from how to design uh, uh, 
Design Your Life, that, that great book out of Stanford, um, how do you just quickly prototype a few different uh, fields and pathways? So you say like, hey, this is something that really excites me, but I don't like X about it. What are other areas that have those things mm. about it that I might want to invest in myself in? That's a great idea. Gap bursts. Uh, this is neat. Um, friends, I, I have all kinds of questions uh, based on, on my reading of Michael's book. But the idea of the forum here is for you to ask your questions, for you to put comments and uh, thoughts to uh, our author. And so, again, if you look at the bottom of the screen, uh, click that raised hand if you want to uh, join us in the video, or click the question mark if you've got a question that you want to type in uh, and share. Uh, and just to get you going, we had a couple of questions from people who couldn't make it today, and I just want to uh, mention these really quickly. Uh, on Twitter, Dave W. asks, if you could speak really quickly to both 21st century apprenticeship models for students and also to nano degrees. Yeah, great questions. I, so I, I think the one of the statements that comes out of the book is that uh, college for all doesn't uh, probably make sense, uh, at least as we have traditionally thought of that, right, uh, sort of statement, and that ultimately we need to be creating different pathways to match students where they are. And so I think whether, I don't know if it's boot camps or nano degrees or what, but the point is that we should be encouraging a flourishing of different educational pathways that students can come into and out of throughout their lives uh, in a variety of ways um, based on where they are in their life right now. And you know, mm -hmm. what we're finding from the book uh, is that certain students are going to college to do what's expected of them, for example, because someone else demanded that they go to college. It turns out that that's not a great reason to go to college. You lack, they, they tend to be very apathetic about the decision. They don't enjoy the experience. And at least in our small data set, 74% of them dropped out or transferred from the college when they came there. That's not a good outcome for the college. It's not a good outcome for the students. Are there other things that they could have done uh, to learn more about themselves, to learn more, to invest in themselves? And maybe college will be in the future, but maybe boot camp is the way that they start out, right? Or, or getting a nano degree, getting a taste of something, getting some credit for that, and then being able to move into a fuller education experience. That's a good answer. Uh, Dave W., thank you very much for the question. Um, there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, and we've got one more question uh, also from Twitter. Um, the uh, awesome Michael Berman, uh, California State, says that the usual expectation is that college equals a job. You know, you go to college to get a job. Um, but he says that according to you, the research shows that this isn't necessarily true. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I'm glad he asked the question. I think he heard me earlier this week uh, talk about uh, talk, talk about the book. So uh, it's a very informed question. So there's a narrative right now uh, out there that uh, that the reason people students choose school is to get a job, right? According to UCLA freshman survey, roughly 90% of students are selecting their school to get a job, and mm. up from roughly two thirds, maybe 30, 40 years ago, and. Uh, the reality is we dug into it and actually looked at what students did, not what they say, but what they actually do, what they actually prioritize, the trade-offs that they actually make. Going to job, going to school to get a job is not at all what students are prioritizing for the most part. Uh, it may be part of their decision making, but it's to, to say that it's the main driver is woefully incomplete. Students are really, and, and I'll just tell your audience the five main uh, reasons that we saw students going to school. We're calling it the first one is help me get into my best school. So these are students that just want to get into the best for its own sake, right? Uh, and it's all about getting in, not necessarily what they'll do on the other side. And yeah, best like has some connotation of there has to be the network and, uh, and, and the ability to get uh, a good job later, but it's not really the job right now because particularly for this group who are often teenagers, uh, yeah. The lowest percentage of teenagers in our nation's history right now have ha uh, participated in the labor force. So most teenagers don't even know what a job is to be able to make a statement like that, like, oh, I, yeah, I'm going to get a job in business. They just don't know what they don't know yet. Um, second was help me do what's expected of me. So these are students who 
growing because someone else demanded it. Third was help me get away. So these are students who are running from something, but not necessarily toward something. And college is something socially acceptable that they can say that they're doing with their time. Uh, the fourth was help me step it up. So these are often students who are looking to get a better job. Uh, and then the last one was help me extend myself. And this is sort of the uh, students who are going for learning's sake. They want to learn more, challenge themselves. They've always yearned to be or do something more. Uh, and now they have the time and money to do it. Uh, these reasons you'll hear like job is sort of implicitly in some of them, but it is not the overriding reason. And I think we need to really buck that trend and uh, present a counter narrative because I think colleges have a big role in helping students just discover who they are in the first place. And that actually feels a lot more uh, comfortable. I think it's closer to the original purpose. I think many of us think about when, when we think about a, a college experience for a student, I'm just not sure right. we're in as productive a way as we could be. Well, that's a really traditional view, isn't it? Uh, you go to college at 18 because you don't know what you're going to do next and you have that supported space where you can really uh, explore that? I think that's exactly right. I think what we have to acknowledge is that uh, some people aren't even entering college with that mindset. And so how do we put the scaffolding and structure around those students such that they can have those range of experiences on the front end uh, that they need to start to be able to make those sorts of decisions and learn more about themselves and it's not clear that a credit hour course uh, sort of mentality or design uh, is going to be the best way to accomplish that in certain cases. I think for certain students, uh, it works really well, right? And we see that. And, and, and some of the yeah. that we have right now around college, maybe we're a little too angsty in some ways. <laughs> mm. Now you mentioned one particular campus, uh, the uh, two-year school. Is it Wayfarer or Wayfaring? Yeah, Wayfarer, yeah. And that's its whole job is uh, take you for two years and, and show you yourself and where you should go. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's a school, it's a startup uh, college. Uh, they have Oregon State uh, uh, approval, but not yet accreditation, uh, where the school uh, grants associates degrees that is essentially in self-discovery. And it's a two year journey in learning about who am I? What do I like? What's my purpose? And helping you identify that. Uh, and all the courses are really built around that. I think it's an interesting question, is two years too long time? Uh, is, is that the right time span? But in terms of an experiment to say, hey, we've been getting this all wrong. We, we sort of, uh, we accept you into your major, we accept you through a course sequence, and then we spit you out on the other end, and then you're like, whoa, is this actually what I wanna be doing? Let's help you discover on the front end and then let you select your major and so forth so that you can really drive down on what you really wanna go uh, deep in. And so they've really, rethought the college experience in some very neat ways to give you those formative experiences up front. Just a quick clarifying question, and then I want to poke the audience a bit more. What um, are you, is your book mostly targeted at traditional age, uh, would be undergraduates and 18 year olds, or are you looking at the entire spectrum of uh, adult learners and senior learners and uh, teenagers? Yeah, we're looking at the entire spectrum. I mean, the name okay. of college is very clearly aimed at that uh, 18 year old demographic and the parents in particular. Uh, but the hope is that as parents read it, they'll say, oh my goodness, this applies to me with decisions I have right now. And the reality is when we did the research, we interviewed students all the way from age 17, all the way up to age 60. And if you look at the percentage breakdown of how it breaks down, uh, we're pretty close to that 40% figure of over 25 uh, and so in other words, our sample looks very similar to the sample of who actually goes to American higher education today and doesn't fit into these buckets of traditional and non-traditional student and the like. I hear that. Um, in fact, just uh, over on Twitter, we had a quick comment from Dave McCool, who suggests, this, is, this isn't a question, it's a comment, maybe there's a business opportunity to create some materials to support some of these gap year bursts. Yeah, I think there, yeah, I think there is, you know, it's interesting. I learned about in the course of researching the book um, that there's this whole world of, of programs starting to emerge that offer curated gap year experiences. So there's uh, some of them that I talk about in the book are Winterline or Global Citizen Year. Uh, and there's an organization called the Gap Year Association uh, that curates and helps people determine, uh, understand what the options are and whether there's financial aid available and so forth. And then there's uh, the other piece of this is that they're gap year fairs where the people actually come to uh, high school campuses or, or, or places where high school seniors are and help them understand other options that are out there. It's a growing trend right now uh, in American education, but I don't think most people have conceptualized it as these bursts, if you will. Uh, and I think there's huge opportunity there because a lot of the folks offering gap years, yeah. I think are still stuck in the notion that it has to be something that's international 
uh, that it has to be, you know, it stretches your boundary and makes you ask, you know, sort of uh, community service oriented questions. And, and not that those are not important things. I think, you know, international travel is great, uh, but it might not be what every single student needs in every circumstance. And right. I think there is right. definitely a place for these gap bursts and people could probably uh, uh, do it in intentional ways that I think would help very quickly build people's muscle around who they are. I think there's a huge opportunity there. I agree. Oh, this is great. Um, uh, thank you, Dave. Um, well, friends, let me ask you to think of one of two questions to pose to our hardworking author guest. Uh, one of them is to think what advice he would give you or your family or people that you're thinking about who are starting to either apply to college the first time or who are thinking about going back. Or think instead about what advice he would give to colleges and universities who are trying to grapple with a student body that they seem maybe they may not be fully understanding, but also when they have new tools like gap years and so on to try and uh, respond to them. So pose one of these questions and again, either use your, um, uh, you know, use video to join us on stage or post a question. And as I say that, the excellent Roxana Riskin has a question. We just quickly put this up on screen so everyone can hear it and see it. So Roxanne asks, are you seeing a need for financial literacy skills for the students? And what are the responsibilities of the student parents? And also what's the university's responsibility for that? Great question, Roxanne. Ter ter terrific question. And I, uh, I did a podcast uh, with Tim Ren uh, Renzetta uh, just last Friday, in fact, um, where it was all about this question of financial literacy and, and, and digging into it. That's his passion. And he runs a nonprofit around this. Uh, so, so certainly encourage you to listen to him and, and what he might say on the topic. I would say certainly that there is a void of financial uh, literacy understanding among many of the students, and it's actually kind of hard to understand what debt they did or did not take out as you sort of dig into their story and figure out what, what ended up happening. Um, but I think the other piece that we see is that uh, a lot of times we in higher education and around higher education on the supply side, if you will, we view this as an investment, and so therefore financial literacy is really important. A lot of students view it as a benefit not an investment. It's something mm. that the next logical step in their life. It's something that they're just going to do. It's all about the upside. And so it's not entirely clear to me that if you offered the financial literacy data or courses or whatever else, that they would know how to consume it. I, my, my takeaway was mm. there's, there's actually a lot of data that's out there that's not being consumed because it doesn't align with how students are in fact perceiving their life questions. Um, and the uh, and and the progress that they're trying to make, and the context, the circumstance that they're actually in, and context is everything. Context gives meaning, and so it's not just a question, I think, of financial literacy, but it's it's couching whatever you do that against uh, the, the circumstance in which a student is in, so that they can actually relate it to them uh, and make sense of that information um, uh, when when they're ready to when they're ready to benefit from it. Wow, that's a bit of a surprise. Um, and that sounds like it, 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 it's going to be a lot more work. We have to really rethink that kind of financial literacy. Uh, we haven't gotten to mentioning debt yet, but we have a question from a long-term uh, friend of the program. We have from uh, Tom Riley. It was a question about a different kind of debt, uh, a larger scale of one. Tom, are you there? Uh, the, I'm a technical guy, and uh, the... the future work that's going to be available is going to be heavily technical stuff to the point of jobs falling away that aren't. And so you're yeah. going to have a great problem of training people for jobs that will, aren't going to be there. If you give the technical guys a year off, you'll never see them again because they're going to go try to make their million. Uh, and, but what I don't see is how this uh, year off is going to pay for it. How are you going to keep them out of the military uh, mm. whose, or, whose job is to change people's heads and just turn them into soldiers, which is one way to do before you do them college. But I, I just don't see that you're talking a realistic situation for what we're headed into as opposed to what we did 20 years ago. 
Yeah, thanks. That's some, that's some pushback. What do you think, Michael? Yeah, thanks for the question. I think there may be a misunderstanding on my language. When I say coding boot camp, I mean a program that teaches you technical skills, not the military. Uh, and so uh, what I'm talking about, and, and, and Tom, tell me if I've misunderstood your question. Uh, but what I'm talking about is a series of experiences in, the, uh, in and around the future of work that gets you to start to build an understanding of, do I like this and do I want to invest in myself to really double down on these technical skills uh, and other skills and so forth so that you could uh, dig in. Um, uh, not, I, I'm, I'm not talking about the military or anything approaching, uh, approaching that. I think that's a good option for a subset, but that's not what I, what I have in mind. Uh, when I say this. In, in fact, many of the students, for example, that we talk to who are trying to run away from a situation, help me get away. Uh, so they're running from a bad hometown, a bad family situation, an abusive stepfather, something like that. Four-year college at that point, probably not a great option because it's all about running away from something, not necessarily towards something. But the military is not a good option there either uh, because it's also a several-year commitment uh, that is out of step with where they are right now in their lives. And so we're, we're talking about a much more, uh, a much shorter burst of an investment in yourself where you're actually getting to work some jobs and make money. So you're actually not losing money by spending on college, but you're making money while learning about yourself. You're doing these uh, uh, coding programs, these technical skills programs, these last mile training programs uh, and the like. And when I say boot camps, all I mean is it's short, faster, cheaper um, education programs. I don't mean military. Uh, one, one other thing, I, I want to make sure, Tom, you have a chance to say if I've understood your question right. But the other thing I will say, I think there's a bit of a debate on what skills will be valued in the future. And the only reason I say that is there's no question that technical skills uh, and, and automation and AI and so forth are becoming a greater part of the future of work and will replace wholesale jobs. But I think it's also true that if you talk to a lot of the people studying this question, that that actually could at some point work on the opposite way, that such that you will need the literacy to engage uh, with, say, uh, coding, but that there will actually need to be far fewer coders because some of these uh, uh, because the productivity from far fewer, thanks to the technology that's going to come in, is going to greatly amplify them. And actually, a lot of the soft skills and critical thinking skills mm -hmm. and so forth that you get from a liberal arts curriculum uh, will 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 be in great demand. And those uh, and those humanity skills around that will be in great demand. You will need the technical literacies to be able to interface and understand what's driving this. Uh, it won't be like we've I think traditionally had the liberal arts in some ways. Uh, but but I think it, it's it's not the case that a lot of those skills will be going away. In fact, the things that are not routine, not rules based, uh, not strict pattern recognition, but are much more intuitive based on developing expertise in other fields, uh, I think will become greatly valued. Uh, all I'm saying uh, on the military, I went through this period in the not during Nam with a. Um, uh, forced military situation and it really messed people's heads up on mm. the technical guy part of it uh, most of your the, your high level technical people will have been drilled on such stuff in high school that they would be bored to tears with introductory stuff and you put them in the real world for a while and they'll sink or swim and the ones you know, you really would like to teach better. They're going to swim, and they'll be gone. Uh, the, you know, and it really doesn't matter. It matters in getting the high level technical job, particularly during the '80s. It meant more to be able to drink large amounts of alcohol and still cope mm -hmm. than it did to write an English sentence. Uh, and so, and this, you know, fortunately that went nutsy, went away somewhat, but in the powerful discrimination against women, all kinds of things like that. But I don't see that the year off is financially viable, nor is it consistent with the type of the work situation we're headed into. Um, and I would be happy to argue that with you, but... The, Okay, so but now I understand. Now I understand the question better. So let me let me just say one more thing on it, and then and then we can we can 
find another question to, to continue to debate on. But the uh, um, so uh, so I'm, I'm certainly not encouraging military. We're on the same page there. Uh, you know, for some people, I think it's a great way to step it up and for them to learn about themselves. But I don't think it's it's not my recommendation. Uh, so I want to be clear on that. The second thing, in terms of the year off, I I, I do disagree with you. I think. Uh, there's more colleges that are starting to partner with gap year programs to provide financial aid for this. There's an opportunity to earn money while you learn. Uh, there is increasingly opportunities with uh, on-ramp programs that uh, the guests on this uh, uh, Future Trends Forum last week, Michelle Wise, uh, just wrote mm -hmm. a book about, uh, where you actually uh, uh, learn, you get placed into an agency that will actually uh, get you work right away and place you into a job. Uh, and so there's actually huge opportunities for it to be a value creating step, not a value destruction step, and actually far more affordable than a college where you're gonna take on a lot of debt and perhaps not graduate. Again, this isn't to say you're not gonna then take that experience and then invest in yourself and go to college. It's just our research was extraordinarily clear that when you see these students, there are whole sets of students who are not ready for the college experience and they shouldn't be going to a traditional one. I'd love to see colleges, frankly, innovate with more experiential learning uh, as well on the front end. Uh, but in the absence of that, I think many more students are going to have to look at these discovery years. Uh, and what I see Thank the you. problem is that they have no vision of the future because all they see is global warming and it's and it's killing them. And without a vision of the future, yeah. you don't do that stuff. And Thank you, Tom. Absolutely. Absolutely. I really appreciate it. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, it is that easy to uh, climb up on stage and interrogate uh, poor Michael. Um, you can just beam right up. It is uh, really quick and easy to do. So uh, if you're in a spot where you can switch your camera on, give it a try. Uh, in the meantime, we have a stack of questions piling in. And so let me just uh, put up a couple of these really quickly. Um, and this is one from uh, uh, Don Bartel. Uh, who says, does much of the discussion apply to those with means of family support to explore? And this would be great if it could apply to all economic quartiles. How can how do you address it? How can it? Yeah, Dan, yeah this is a tremendously important question. I'm really glad you asked it. Um, it's something that we're learning a lot about, frankly, right now. And so if others out there have, uh, have, have perspective or colleges can get into this, I think it's really important. Let me give a couple other stats about people who take gap years. So I said that they do better than those who don't. Uh, but the, the, the flip side of it is that if you're in the low, uh, the bottom uh, economic quintile or quartile, uh, a lot of students who take a gap year don't ever actually get into college. And so then they don't actually benefit from the experience and all that it brings you. And so I think a large part of that reason is exactly what you said, that they can't afford these experiences. And so they end up the job in Burger King or wherever, and they just sort of stay there and never get out of that. And so, uh, so one, uh, I think that colleges, one of the recommendations in the book is, is that if colleges could partner with these experiences up front, then you could use aid to support it and allow many more people to take advantage of it rather than just those from uh, the, the wealthier strata of society. The second thing I will say uh, is that folks like uh, Global Citizen Year, and I encourage you all to check it out. Uh, Abby, the, the leader of it, would be great to have on your, uh, on, on your forum at some point, Brian. But uh, uh, they, are, they actively have uh, fundraised so that they can offer financial aid, scholarships, uh, for students who are not in the upper stratas of American society as well and reach down into the lower ones. And then the last thing I'll say is we actually in our book, you know, we talked to a lot of first gen students, a lot of students oh, okay. came from the bottom 60% of, uh, so each of the quintiles basically. And actually our, our sample in the book is overrepresented among uh, the lowest income students uh, in, in, in term, it, it we're relatively equally represented in other ways across American higher education, but we are overrepresented on low income students uh, in, in, in the book from the bottom three quintiles. Um, and actually we, see, we saw several of these students take what amounted to gap year type experiences, but without that language around it. So they would say, I didn't get into my school, I had to work. Uh, but my, my parents put bounds around the experience. So they were working, they continued to do some learning on the side, and then they reapplied to college. And I, I just think we need to do a better job of creating clear pathways. So that doesn't just become the exception that's reserved for the elite, 
it's much easier for for people from any walk of life to get into and then get out of and into college right after that so they don't get stuck oh that's a great answer uh and uh, i want to follow up with you michael afterwards about uh abby and other people on this dan what a terrific question i'm really really glad you asked um and we have more questions the stack is beginning to teeter it's getting high this is great uh we have a question from the uh, excellent lisa durf uh who asks uh, what experiences do educators in early childhood education need to provide to their students at the beginning of formal education to help our society rethink the college experience? Thank you for asking, Lisa. Lisa, that is an outstanding question. I admit I have not thought nearly deeply enough about this. I did a podcast uh, that I think came out today, actually, uh, with the folks uh, at, at the uh, Highlander uh, Institute, um, Nick and, and Christina. Um, where they started to see some of these connections. Their basic argument was that the process and the, the theory, we haven't talked so much about that, but the theory that underlied the research uh, about what progress are you trying to make in this circumstance that we used would be something that would be really good to teach students who are much, much younger to start to build the capacity in, in them for them to have the metacognition and develop agency that they could understand uh, where they were in life and what they were trying to do next, not sort of with year master plan, but in much more incremental ways. And that if you could help students build that muscle much earlier. And so sort of in my head, I said, well, gosh, I'm missing the book because we didn't address what high school should do. And she was like, no, no, no. The bigger thing is that like you didn't even like you mentioned that, but you didn't even think about what elementary and middle schools should be doing, let alone mm -hmm. early childhood education. And so all I guess I would say is I think my thinking is super early on this and I don't know that I have a great answer but the process that we use to help people understand where they are uh, that, that relies on um, understanding what they're, be, what they're prioritizing and helping them see themselves from afar, if you will, uh, is, is a skill set that she thought a lot of people would benefit. Uh, and I suspect learning how to ask questions uh, in the right way so you could distill that from others in your lives uh, and that educators could help uh, bring those to the surface for uh, students so that they could understand them and then counsel them appropriately uh, would, would be an enormous set of tools uh, to help them. The last thing I guess I would say is part of what I, I took away from the book is, you know, there, there's these students who, who go to college to get into their best school. And there's these students that go into college to do what's expected of them. And for both of those students, it's sort of two sides of the same coin. They're going because it's the next logical step at some point in their life. It's just sort of like what they're supposed to do. They're playing the game and they're just going along to get along. And I'll be totally honest, like I was one of those students. I was getting, I was going to get into my best school. I thought when I went to business school later that I was going to step it up. I was also going to get into my best school there. And um, the, the reality of the situation is that uh, I think we have have misled students into thinking about the game as opposed to the process of learning itself and to enjoy the process not just necessarily seek the outcome and focus on getting into things it should be much more about the process of learning and the beauty and joy of learning and so forth so that they become much more engaged and have that growth mindset around what they can do i think those would be tremendous takeaways as well that's a really really great response uh, thank you michael well, and you can tell uh, we are people, I, I would say, actually, if you want to prepare the uh, pre-K kids, we should put them on the forum uh, because people here are definitely, definitely skilled at asking great questions. Uh, and speaking of which, we have one from Molly Butler. Let me flash this on the screen. Uh, Molly asks, do you think your suggestions are somewhat similar to just going into college undecided? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great question. And, and I, I, so... What I would say is um, there's no question. A lot of students are going into college undecided. And I would say, I think that's okay. I don't think that's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, my recommendation is not necessarily that people who help me get into my best school but don't know what field they want to go into uh, right. uh, shouldn't go to college. I think they should. There's excellent success rates. They learn a lot about themselves. And in our data set, 83% of them were thrilled with the experience that they had had. Uh, I was thrilled with my experience. It's more if you're in these jobs of help me do what's expected of me or help me get away, that there I think uh, it's not so much that you're undecided. It's like you're actually unexcited about college itself. And that's a different circumstance and a different situation. So mm -hmm. depth is 
different. It's not that you don't know what major you want to be or what you want to be when you leave. I think plenty of people are in that. And I, I actually would say we need to be more honest about that as a society and say that's okay. And college is a great place for you to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, in some cases, and that, that's sort of where I think we need to tamp down some of the, well, you're going to go and you're going to pick your major and you're going to go get your you know, uh, degree. I think we need to tamp that down. Uh, and uh, but but if you're going to get away from something, a four year experience with a lot of debt is probably not going to end well, uh, is is the point. And that's very different from just being undecided. I will say, like, if you're in Help Me Step It Up, those students tended to have great clarity about what they wanted next. Mm -hmm. when they up, it's when they didn't. But they're, you know, a guided pathway program where there's no choice in the course sequence. You're just going in. You're going to take your courses and you're going to get out and go do what you want to do. That makes a heck of a lot of sense there. I think in a lot of the other jobs, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think it might explain why uh, guided pathway programs on average work better than traditional community college uh, sequences, but they're clearly not working for every single student. And I think that entering motivation and understanding uh, of why uh, could help community colleges maybe tailor their programs a little bit better based on, based on those entering motivations and understanding of where you are. That's a really, really rich answer. And I can see um, there's a lot of advice there for quite a few institutions to heed. Um, we have uh, one question actually that comes up um, actually uh, from myself. Uh, and this is for your uh, help me get away students. Uh, and that's kind of one of our stereotypes of higher education is that students like to go far away uh, to change up their lives. But, but I'm, I'm wondering, is this population shrinking? Uh, Americans are moving less within the country than we ever have. Um, we have access to more technology to get away virtually. Um, and also a, one of your getaway points is people who want to get away from their, um, from their job. Well, we have the gig economy rising or people are actually having multiple jobs. Uh, I'm wondering, is, is that sector just uh, starting to shrink or is there life in it yet? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I'll say the help me get away job uh, surprised me uh, because I thought get away would be a part of something, but I didn't think it would be the entirety of something, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and for, you know, so students in the help me get into my best school, for example, um, I, reinventing themselves with new people was a very clear part of it. Help me get away was literally all about getting away. It was like I like none of this is working for me. None of my life is working for me right now. And yeah. I just run as fast as possible. And it wasn't necessarily geographic, right? It was, it might just be getting out of a bad situation in college was sort of the ripcord or the escape valve. Um, that having been said, it was also the smallest percentage that we saw, at least in our data set. And I don't think our data set is representative. It's also not longitudinal, right? We don't know if it's growing or shrinking over time. Um, it's just what you know. We happen to see uh, among the two hundred plus stories that we uh, uh, chronicled, and, and then the thousand plus survey items that we or people we've surveyed. Um, but it so it's, it doesn't seem to me to be the dominant. I think your hypothesis is a really interesting one, which is we do see way less geographic mobility than we did in the United States, and we know that students, despite the New York Times perception, they tend to enroll in a place that's. Uh, within 50 miles, maybe 100 miles at most of, of where they grew up. Uh, and so I guess the question I more asked out of it was, if these students need to get away, are we giving them the proper pathways to be able to do that? Or are we forcing them to actually attend um, at a place that's not actually giving them that escape uh, that they need to fulfill their job and then allowing them to pivot to something uh, that I would say is more productive and future oriented? Well, I'm glad to hear that I'm not completely wrong on this. Um, but uh, no, I, don't think so. I, I, I mean, I've, and you know, I, I would say, and I hope everyone hears this. Uh, you know, I hope people read this book uh, in this group, and then they ask a lot more questions and do a lot more research and, and poke some holes and find some things that we didn't think about and sharpen the recommendations because this is sort of our first draft of that, right? And I view it as uh, an ongoing dialogue and. The jobs to be done that people have when they hire an experience, it's they're not static, right? Like they can evolve over time as the context and circumstances of people's individual lives to what colleges actually offer to the state of the nation and the world change. Those things will evolve as well. And so this isn't a static view of like 50 years from now, people will still be going for these five reasons. I would, I would expect it to evolve. And I think that's a good thing. 
Well, that's uh, actually a terrific transition to a, a really deep question we have from Charles Finley. Let me put this up on the screen. He's at Northeastern. And he asks, if we're talking about lifelong continuous learning as the goal for our AI work future, why advocate for a four-year college experience? I, it, it's a terrific question. Uh, Ryan, your own book uh, coming out in uh, next year uh, grapples a lot with this question, uh, uh, having, having read it and enjoyed it. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it's an interesting question. Um, so part of the statement, I, I hope, is that, yes, learning is lifelong. And actually, one of the central, uh, we make three points for students in the conclusion. And one of them is just this, that learning is lifelong. And then a lot of reporters uh, have asked me, well, are you saving for you know college for your kids? You, you hypocrite. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. pathways. And my answer is yes, because they might go to four-year college, but they might also have many educational experiences throughout their life that overall adds up to the same cost of college. It just might take place uh, over a much longer time horizon and in bursts that come uh, at different times in their life as, as, as they're living and taking U-turns and different pathways and, and skill yeah. and so forth, right? And that, that would be a tremendously wonderful thing, I think, for that to happen. And I would hope that they would have a nest egg to be able to afford them that. Uh, so that's sort of my thought. I, I will say one conclusion I left with that may be counterintuitive for the disruptive innovation guys, um, me and Clay, um, who, you know, everyone associates us with the prediction of how many colleges are gonna close or merge in the next couple decades. Sure. I will say, you know, I took strongly away from the research that for a certain slice of America anyway, not everyone, uh, but a certain slice of America, the stereotypical residential uh, four-year experience is not going away because what they want, it, like the job that they have is that experience itself. Like they want the classic four-year experience in a beautiful brick and mortar campus at a place with a great ranking and prestige uh, where they can reinvent themselves with new people. That's what they're looking to do. And there are other ways to have that experience. There's no question we could curate some of them. And I sort of float a couple of those ideas in the book uh, and you float many more in your book. Um, but the, uh, but, but the, the, I, I did take away from it that for a certain set of students that experience this, they want that experience. And so it's not going away anytime soon, despite what uh, uh, some of us futurists might uh, say. Well, that's a really brave thing to do. A uh, few people would uh, admit to that and be that flexible. I uh, appreciate the honesty and the candor there. Um, speaking of which, friends, we're down to the last couple of minutes of the session. So I'm going to uh, offer a little uh, twist here on the interface. Uh, you should see on the right edge of the screen a little teal colored box, the podium on it. So if you've got video capability, simply press that little button and you'll appear on screen right away. I can't stop you. So it'll be just out of control. Um, so let's think, think more about this future. Uh, Charles asked a really, really good question about you know, how, our, uh, uh, how things will change and the impact of one particular technology under AI. Uh, are there other changes in the future that, that you see or that you, you've seen in the forum over the past three plus years um, that you want us to draw attention to? Um, you know, do you see changes based on, say, open uh, education, open access? Are there other technologies that are changing things? What do you see as the impact of demographics on the model that Michael has sketched out? What do you see of the future? You know, seize the podium or uh, type in another question. Now is your chance. All right, and we have Tom back. Hello, Tom. All right, on AI, very soon, the AI chipsets will be out and AI will shrink by orders of magnitude and they'll be all over the place. Very soon, all workers will be pairs. There will be a human being with their AI, just as now I have a, whoops, calculator. <laughs> of course, I bumped the damn screen. All right. Okay. Consequently, that's a very, very different educational system, work system, everything changes when the AIs get serious. And just, it's coming at you like a freight train, look out. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Um, that's something, again, we keep coming back to, and we may do something more with that uh, in the future, uh, the series of sessions. Um, we have another question that's come up from the awesome Sonia Strahl who asks, do you think the availability of financial aid for structured gap year experiences might help widen this opportunity to others who might not have the means or support for doing this? 
I do. I think this is a central recommendation that I hope colleges take away is that uh, they almost have an obligation to figure out how to how to work in those experiences and not just the financial aid, potentially giving credit for those experiences and the learning that you have in them as well, uh, so that they actually count towards something and reduce your load uh, on the back end. Uh, I, I think it's a really it's a really important thing that I that, that I see where otherwise we'll be. Uh, will be unequally giving that benefit uh, in, in society and, and others will be benefiting from it and learning about themselves and, and, and low-income students might not be. Oh, good question, Sonia. Um, and uh, I'm, I hate to say it, Michael, but this, this has really brought us to the end of the hour. Um, we've raced through at top speed through your book uh, and you've been enormously generous with just sharing us uh, so much so, so clearly and so candidly about your thinking. Uh, let's ask first, um, where are you going to be for the next month? Are you going to be on the road uh, showing your book off to a wide variety of audiences? Yeah, I'll be on the road. Uh, it, it, September is uh, a little quiet outside of some travel within my home state of Massachusetts. So if you're, in, if you're in Massachusetts, come by in Lexington and some events there and so forth. And then once October hits, October and November, I will be uh, every single week somewhere else. So uh, it, it'll, it'll be great fun and hopefully uh, learning a lot. Well, excellent, excellent. Uh, well, when you're doing all of this, uh, what's the best way for people to keep up with you? Yeah, uh, so at Michael B. Horn, Twitter account, uh, or go to michaelbhorn.com, sign up for my newsletter there. Uh, and then I'm starting to make better use of Instagram uh, and learning how to use that, but my wife still says I'm terrible at it. <laughs> well, keep going. It's always good to learn. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate this and good luck with your book. It's an important book and I strongly recommend it to everybody. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me and uh, your guests uh, next week are, 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 are great as well. Oh, thanks for saying that. We know it. Well, let's talk about that. And thanks again, Michael. Uh, friends, don't go away. Let me just tell you about what we're up to for the next week. Uh, next week, we return back to Unism. That's that uh, powerful, fascinating inter-university collaboration that's been growing very, very quietly, and the forum has been one of the few places where people actually be able to learn about this. We're going to have Jill Buban there uh, talking about their work, which is fascinating, and along with her is going to be Michael London, who is going to be speaking about a particular partnership they've done with a very, very interesting project called Examity. So this is your chance to dive into Unison, look under the hood, and see where that's going. It's important stuff. Now, at the same time, if you want to go back and catch some of these previous episodes, uh, going back almost four years, head again to the FTF Archive on YouTube. Just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF Archive. And if you'd like to keep talking about all this, we're all over social media. So keep talking on Slack, LinkedIn, Facebook, and, of course, Twitter. In the meantime, thank you all for terrific questions. Terrific comments. I, mean, I think this is really, this week's subject is really important. Our guest was terrific. If you want to keep talking about this, we'll see you online. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye bye.